going to do our third, or sorry, our second part on three full weeks of spiritual warfare. Daniel chapter 10, please. Three full weeks of spiritual warfare. This is part two. Instead of reading the chapter again, we'll read a few verses and then keep your Bible open as we go through the chapter. Daniel chapter 10, verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. And the thing was true. The time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hedekel, then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. His body was also, also was like a, the barrel, his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision for the men that were with me. Saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Let's pray. Father, take your word and do with it what you will. Strengthen us and bless us, challenge us, convict us. Do your own will, Father, in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So last week we've done a bit more of a background. We won't do that really this morning because we take up too much time. But Daniel is in captivity in Babylon. And Daniel is now, he has heard how the work that was going on in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, remember, the temple had no worship. The Lord said in Jeremiah 29 that he, had a thoughts to do uh, Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah, good. That they would go into Babylon and they would come out after 70 years. And of course, that happened. Now between Daniel 9, when he's praying about this, he's reading the books. And one of the books was the book of Jeremiah. And he's reading how Jeremiah had said this in chapter 9. Then we get that well-known and much debated about topic of the 70 weeks of Daniel's prophecy. And so they're working at the, at the temple and, and of course Nehemiah comes out to work on the walls when you read the book of Nehemiah. Now in chapter 10, something's happened between chapters 9 and chapter 10 and some think there's about a 15-year gap there. The work had slowed down and come to a halt and so Daniel goes into fasting because he's mourning. Remember last week, he's mourning because of the lack of worship that was to be at Jerusalem. Hasn't happened. Another year has passed and the enemy seems to be getting the foothold in Jerusalem again and nothing has taken place. So Daniel goes into mourning. Now, when we look at this, verse 2, in those days, that's the days we've spoken of. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now, it is debated here whether Daniel was actually doing this as a fast or whether Daniel was doing this because he couldn't eat, because he was so upset in mourning for the temple. Either way, he did not eat for three, that is pleasant bread, for three full or three whole weeks. And instead, he went into a time of worship. He went into a time of mourning and praise, and he didn't even realize what was happening in the heavenlies. There was a war started. 
A battle was raging for three whole weeks. Notice here in verse four, in the four and 20th day of the first month. That is important. Sometimes we think we read these dates and they don't really mean, mean anything, but everything in scripture is there for a reason. In the four and 20th day of the first month, so the, the first month would have is the month of Nisan, which would be around our April time. And so in the four and 20th day, or, or in the 24th of the first month of Nisan, which is our April, that would be Passover time. The time of the Passover. The Passover wasn't happening because the temple worship hadn't been fulfilled again. It hadn't been set up again. And hence, that's why the date is important because it's around coming up the Passover when the blood should have been shed, when the animals should have been sacrificed. And hence, Daniel is in deep mourning, concerned about the lack which is in Jerusalem. The enemy has come, remember last week, and they had, the Samaritans had come down and they had written the dates down. Look what you've done in this date and that and wrote a letter and sent it to the king in Babylon. And the work was halted. So notice this. It's the first month, which would be about April, which is Passover. Notice what it says here then. When we run our eyes down, and let's read a little bit further. From our reading, it says in verse 7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. Now, the vision of the previous verses, if you go, when you go home, we'll not go to because we have so much to go through. That vision, if you go through to Revelation chapter 1 and read it when you go home, it is all typified as the Lord Jesus Christ, the, ex, the exalted, the ascended, the glorified Christ whom John sees on the Isle of Patmos. Now, maybe it's strange or maybe it's not, but there's a pattern forming here. Daniel is in Babylon under captivity. And this glorious man comes and stands before Daniel. John is in captivity on the Isle of Patmos and he sees what seems to be the same man because everything that you read in this chapter is the same attributes that are in Revelation chapter one. And hence, when you're reading the book of Daniel, Daniel is told after the prophecies to shut the book and close it. Shut the book and close it. But in John and Revelation chapter one and the two, he's told to open the book and reveal it. So they're like two bookends, these books. And the, 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 the beasts and the, the, the metals of the, the visions and the dreams that you see in Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's dream sees the man ahead of gold, arms and breasts of silver, belly of brass, legs of iron, and toes and feet of iron and clay. Then in chapter 2, that's the head of gold was the Babylonian kingdom. Then the silver was the Medo-Persian, where we are reading now. Because, because this is Cyrus and Darius of the Medes and the Persians. Remember the coalition government? Can two walk together except they be agreed and one overtook the other? We're seeing it in our own government. And of course, then we go from the Medo-Persian kingdom of the silver to the bronze, the bronze of the brass, and that was Alexander the Great. Then the legs of iron was the pagan Roman Empire. And that's when our Lord Jesus was crucified under Pontius Pilate and then the feet. And if you were to get that man and lay him on a map from the east of Babylon right across, you would find the legs and the feet would go to Rome and then the feet would go on in as if they're heading towards the landmass of Europe, even in the pictorial form of it. And so whenever you see that, by the time you go into uh, Daniel 2, the head of gold is Babylonian kingdom, and that's Nebuchadnezzar. By the time you go to Daniel 3, chapter 3, what do they do? The, the king gets a big monument made of gold. He's the head of gold. Now he says, well, I'm going to make a monument of gold, and you're all going to bow down and worship me when the music plays. In other words, you're going to jump to my tune. And of course, we know that you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they 
They don't buy. And then you go into Daniel 4, and that's the, uh, the madness of Nebuchadnezzar, the seven times of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4. And that's when he's, he eats grass like an animal and his, his hair is matted like feathers and so on. The Lord puts him through that. Daniel 5, we have Belshazzar's feast with a handwriting on the wall and the, Medo, uh, the Babylonian kingdom is destroyed, but the Medo-Persians come in and take over and hence we have Cyrus and Darius of the Medes and the Persians. That's where we are. Notice here, this was meant to be around the Passover time. There was a vision shown of this man and most people believe it was a pre-Bethlehem appearance and known as the theophany of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in Revelation chapter 1 and it's here. Some don't think it is because he needs help from Michael the archangel whenever we go into this chapter. And why would that happen? Well, I don't know. I'm just being honest with you. If I knew, I would tell you. But why does he use you and I? Why does he just not do it? So notice this. This one you see in Daniel 10 is the one in Revelation chapter 1. Here, he appears around the time of the morning when it should be Passover. And who else but this one became flesh? Here is the one who would become flesh as the Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ. Years later, he's going to become flesh and be our Passover. And then in Revelation, he's risen again and exalted the living Christ. And why am I telling you that? Because, you see, there's a spiritual warfare. There's more than just this room. There's more than just what you see and hear. And, and whether it be uh, demonic forces upon elitists in our, in our world, you might say, do you believe that? Yes, I do. I believe many of the higher ranking, I'm not talking about those even in Stormont or anywhere else, but I'm talking about those who are the high ranking elitists, the Bilderberger group and the, and the Rothschilds and, 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 and further on, all of those groups, 33 degree masonry, they pledge allegiance to Lucifer. And they worship him. They worship him. And so when we look at this, when we look at this, it, it's so important that we can see right here there's a spiritual battle. There's maybe even a spiritual battle going on for your mind at the minute. There's maybe a spiritual battle going on for your loved ones at the minute. There's definitely a spiritual battle going on for our land at the minute. Definitely. Demonic princes or demons certainly do exist. But listen, so does the Lord Jesus Christ. And your father is above all others and above all else. Why does he allow this? Simply because I don't know. Being honest with you. Something I don't know, I'll tell you I don't know. I don't know. But in all these things is for this reason, it will glorify him when it's all over. You and I will see our emptiness, our inabilities, and realize exactly what grace really is. Because we are saved by grace through faith. Not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God and not of works, lest any of us should boast. There's going to be no boasting in heaven, you know that. There's going to be plenty of praising. There's going to be plenty of singing. And if you don't like singing, you're going to have to get used to it. And if you can't sing, the Lord will give you a glorified body where you'll be able to sing. I think. <laughs> But then again, he says, make a joyful noise. <laughs> Hence, every week, that's what I do. Brothers and sisters, there's a spiritual war going on. Now, listen, 
Christ won the victory at Calvary. His blood shed over our sin, over death itself. Christ won the victory. But in our walk, there is that then which is not in Christ and those who are outside of Christ. And there are those, as you and I as believers, when we become not possessed now, take note of this, not possessed as a believer, but oppressed. Big difference. Oppressed. And many can become oppressed of the devil. And in your weakest moment, your weakest moment, when you realize you can't, or maybe you're mourning for the loss of the worship that you once had, and you're on your knees, and your heart is broken, your eyes roll down waters like rivers of water with tears, saying, Lord, I just can't do this. We'll be honest. Who, who sometimes thinks, Lord, I can't do this. I can't go on. There you are, me. This is me. And whether it be for whatever reason, brothers and sisters, do you know when Daniel was on his knees, when Daniel was in mourning, notice that, in mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, mourning, the greatest battle was taking place in the heavenlies. And he was part of it on the earth. You know, it says here that this man, glorious man, comes and Daniel alone saw the vision. And brothers and sisters, when God gives us the vision, gives you, let's do it personally, me, the vision, not everybody's going to get on board because they can't all understand it or see it. A lot of people can't understand your passion for Christ. A lot of people can't understand your love for him. A lot of people can't understand your drive and enthusiasm that you have to serve the Lord, to be in your place, to be there in worship and in prayer and the sacrifice of yourself. None may understand, but nevertheless, if it's your vision that you've been given, then you must walk in it, even if it means alone. What did we sing earlier? Though no one join me, still I will follow. Though no one join me, still I will follow. Notice here in Daniel 10 and verse 8. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision and there remained no strength in me for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words, and when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face and my face toward the ground. You know what Daniel is saying here? I'm Daniel who prays three times a day. I'm Daniel. And God shut the land's mouth for me when I was in the pit or the prison. Hold on a wee second. But when I seen him, but when I seen him, when my eye had a full view of him and his glory, he says, everything I thought in me was good was corrupt. Everything I thought in me was good was corrupt. And in his presence, I had no strength. I had no strength whatsoever in his presence. See, brothers and sisters, sometimes, and look, Again, let me emphasize this. I believe in rejoicing. I believe in praise. I believe in being lively and active and loving the Lord and worshiping him in our worship. I believe in all of that. But sometimes people go to this point where they say, oh, the Lord is moving and they get on. Uh, they get on as if they are God and he is not. Do you know what I'm saying? Ordering God to do what they want him to do. I'm going to tell you, God, how to do it and do it right now. Listen, he's still God. He's still God. In fact, Daniel 
the man greatly beloved of God. Daniel is praying three times a day. He's a prophet of the Lord. And when he sees him just, he can't even stand in his presence. There remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. He says, I ended up on my face. And that was just by hearing the voice when he spoke to him. Ask Isaiah about that in Isaiah 6. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. The throne, his train filled the temple. The angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw him. What happened to Isaiah? He couldn't stand in his presence either. He says, woe is me for I am undone. In other words, I'm nothing in your presence. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Again, John in chapter 1 of Revelation, when he sees this man, this Christ, he falls at his feet as dead, John says, and he says, and he laid his right hand upon me. And only for the touch of grace of the Lord could we stand in his presence. I think many have lost their reverence Respect of God. I've lost it. My perfect love of Christ casts out fear in my life from him. He loves you and I. He's our heavenly father. But I still respected my father. I reverenced him as my earthly father. And I loved him as my father. But I wouldn't have got on irreverently before him, my dad would have put the boot in me. (laughs) Notice here, time's flying. Notice here. Listen to what, let's go right down to verse 12. Then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Notice from the first time you set your heart, God heard it from the outset. First time you've prayed, brother or sister, about something, and when you get off your knees, you think, ah, oh, well, there it is, I've prayed about it, and maybe God's not going to do anything about it. Listen, God hears every prayer of yours. And we say it on a regular basis, and God's delays are not his denials. Can you imagine Daniel mourning, actually mourning because of the lack of worship? I wonder sometimes what our prayer is about. Is it more about, you know, Auntie Aggie's big toe she stubbed in the end of the bed when she got up to answer the phone? By all means, pray for her big toe if you want. What is our what is our our, our our prayers before him like? Is it the shopping list all the time? I remember when my girls were young. I mean really young. And I was in one of the bedrooms, we were in Belfast living, and I was on my knees with my elbows on the bed praying. And the door opens and these two wee totes come walking in. And they come around and they go, Oh, and I come in. I said, get down on your knees. And they get down on the knees before me, and Ellie couldn't even see over the bed. She was like this, and Jody wasn't much better. And I says, right, we're going to pray, girls. Come on. And so Jody, simple wee prayer, prayed. She went, Ellie, it's your turn. Ellie went, oh, I, I, I don't know what to do. Your turn, you pray, Ellie. And they're going like this, elbowing each other. I said, Ellie, just pray. She went, okay, okay. She says, thinking what to pray. And Jody whispers in her ear, Ask him for a Barbie bag. (laughs) Ask him for a Barbie bag. I 
God knows all our needs. But I wonder, are we asking him for the latest model of the next car? What are we, what way do we come before him in prayer? Is it, is it with worship? Is it with, is it with pathos? Is it from our heart? From the first day, his prayer was heard. Notice, he says, you set thine heart to understand. See the word set there? He needs to look that for a minute. It's the word nothan. And it means you gave your heart. You yielded your heart. You dedicated your heart and you delivered your heart up to me. That's what it meant. I wonder do we come with that sort of heart to the meeting? Do we come to that sort of heart to the, to the prayer meeting? Do we come with that sort of heart to wherever we are, our closet, our prayer closet? Do we come with that sort of heart delivered fully up to him? Because that's the heart that he saw. That's the heart that God saw. Notice, it means you gave your heart, you yielded your heart, you dedicated and you delivered your heart. You set your heart on me and gave it to me. And brothers and sisters, sometimes our prayers are cold. I'm as bad as the next man. I'm not saying I'm any better. But sometimes our prayers are cold and heartless. Frozen. Frozen. Loveless. But Daniel came because he realized it's near Passover. And again, another year, there's no worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. The work has stopped. And my heart is broken because of this. This city of the great king is in ruins and the temple is half built as it were. And the blood has not been applied for maybe 15, actually more, 85 years. But 15 years from they were allowed to go back. Brothers and sisters, when do we give and yield and dedicate our heart to deliver it up to Christ? When we come, we go, uh, Lord, uh, God bless us, that and the other. Oh, I was to pray for that wee woman. Yes, Lord, not. Okay, I'm away. And Daniel was for three weeks, could hardly eat, fasting from delicate, delicious food. That worship would be started again in Jerusalem. Notice, he said, from you set your heart, See that word set? It means also to, you know, he delivered, you've given it and it's fixed. I've given him a heart or to fix it. And sometimes we say, oh, I got saved so many years or months or weeks ago and I gave the Lord my heart. And you know, do you remember that first time when you really did give the Lord your heart? When you said, it's all yours, Lord, do with it as you will. And, and whatever happens and comes along, oh, we take it back. We take it back. And when we take it back, the beating heart that we had of love and passion for Christ, the beating heart of love for him, the beating heart that wouldn't stop because of him, you know what happens? It becomes hardened and calloused and withered and dried and, and maybe even dead. Maybe even dead. In Genesis 1 and 17, speaking of the Lord creating sun, moon, and stars, notice what it says. Genesis 1, 17, it says, And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. It's the same word here for set thine heart to understand. It's the word nathan. In other words, when God set the sun, moon, and stars in the heavens. Now listen, can you imagine if God set them and it says, oh, you know what, after a period of time, maybe I don't love you the way I used to. Maybe I don't want you the way I used to. I'm going to start picking the stars and the sunlight, but I'll die. 
would, would career into something else and crash and burn. But the word set is the exact same word, you set your heart. Imagine if this, this man, Christ, you set your heart, you delivered it up, you yielded it to me. And because of that, your words were heard. In other words, prayers of Daniel with a set heart moved heaven. Moved heaven to attack the demonic forces that were ruling the earth. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. The prayers of Daniel when he set his heart the prayers of Daniel moved heaven to go to war with the demonic forces that were ruling over the earth. Ah, uh, the heart of the matter. It's the heart of the matter. In Job 32 and verse 8, it says, But there is a spirit in man and the inspiration of the Almighty giveth him understanding. Daniel has given us heart that he might understand. Notice, understand what, Daniel? I've already spoken to you about the 70 weeks. I've already spoken to you. You might not have fully understand what I've told you. I've already been in the lion's den. I've done this, that, and the other. And he could go on. I've given you the visions and the dreams, and I've explained them to you, that you can go on to the, listen, the higher echelons of society, and you can say this, is what your dream was. Thou art the head of gold, Nebuchadnezzar. And now you're about 84, 85 years of age, and you think you still have to learn. Of course you do, because God's infinite. We're all learning. But here, he says, you set your heart and gave it to me. Lord, tell me more. Why? Why is this happening since you moved and released my people to Jerusalem. Why is it stopped? Why is the enemy allowed to hinder us? Why did you allow this to happen, Lord? Why is it not the, the, the blood that's going to be shed at Passover again another year? Why, why, why? I need to understand, Lord. Take my heart, Lord, and do with it what you will, but help me to understand it. Now, there's a prayer, isn't it? There's a prayer. You take my heart, Lord, and you do with my heart what you will. What you will. And help me to understand what you're doing. Secondly, he says, to chasten thyself before thy God. Notice, to chasten thyself before thy God. The word chasten here is the word on naw. And it's a strange word because we think we know what chasten means, but in the original text, this is what it means. It's the idea to be occupied. It gives the idea to be busied with something. And what it means is once you occupied your heart and your mind, once you occupied, Daniel, your heart and you occupied your mind before your God. Your words were heard. Do you ever come before the Lord and you go to pray and something pops into your mind, someone comes to your mind, and when you do that, all of a sudden you're here and you're with the Lord in prayer communing, and something comes around here, and the Lord's there, and all of a sudden, you're like this. Oh, I was praying. Your mind's away after that one, or this thing, or this problem. Do you ever get that? Your mind's away, see? Your mind was occupied with something else. I get it all the time. I'm being honest. Happens to me all. Happened to me this morning driving here. I was talking to the Lord when I'm driving. Lord, you know how much I love you. And, and I've seen a big bird so I thought it was a bird of prey. I see a bunch of, oh, there's that big bird of prey over there. <laughs> Happens to me all the time. I try not to let it happen. I get on my knees to worship the Lord in prayer. 
Yeah, just to worship him in prayer. And one of you's jump into my head. Oh, yes. I do pray for you then. Daniel got to the place where because of where that temple was and no blood being shed again, Daniel got to the place where he was saying, Lord, I'm not going to be distracted again. I'm going to busy myself and occupy myself with you until there's a breakthrough. Uh, that's what happens, isn't it? And some of us will go, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. There's nothing going to occupy my heart and mind again, Lord. I'm going to do that. And you leave, uh, you leave here and you go home and you get your dinner and you say, I'm, I'm going to pray as, as soon as I get my dinner over. I'm going to go and seek the face of the Lord for this evening. And I'm going to do that. And you get your dinner over and someone says, do you want a cup of tea? And you sit and you have your cup of tea. Next thing you know, you're... It's not the human form, isn't it? <gasps> I was meant to pray, Lord. I am so sorry, Lord. And next thing you're away running somewhere and you're going, Lord, it's time for the meeting, sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm being real with you, aren't I? Really? I'm being real. And listen, I'm, this isn't condemnation because you know what? We're all the same. We're all the same. But what if everyone in here, I don't know Manny's here this morning. But what if we all were able to occupy ourselves in the place with God? What if we were able to occupy ourselves for our land before God? Chasing ourselves, give our hearts fully to him then, occupy all that we are with Christ. I wonder what would happen in the spiritual realm. I wonder would the, the murder clinics of abortion, would they all close? I wonder would drug addicts and alcoholics be delivered from their addictions? I wonder would we see people falling to their knees all over Ulster and crying for mercy, for salvation in Christ? If we were like that, church, if we were, if we were like that, what if we called a fortnight every night of prayer in here where we would come in and seek the face of God and leave when God allows us to leave and gives us leave? I wonder, I wonder how many of us would actually come every night or we'd be occupy ourselves I would, but it's football tonight. Come on, brother. I would, but it's something else tonight. I would, but it's... Ladies, I don't know. I have to go and meet the girls tonight. I wonder how much we want worship restored in Ulster. I mean, I'm not talking about the Mickey Mouse stuff. Let's go into a darkened room and flash lights on a glitter ball until we all sweat a lot and say it was the presence of God. It's not. Brothers and sisters, it's not. But I just wonder what would happen if we did. Boy, I must close. Daniel chastened himself. There's a root word here that gives the idea that he testified to himself or spoke to him, sung to himself who he was and who God was. And so he occupied himself with that, with that. Thirdly, it just says, and he prayed in verse 12. 
So he prayed, the, it says, thy words were heard. Thy words were heard. Notice here from, from the first, notice verse 12. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. Full stop for a second. No, there's not in the original text nor in the, in the word there. Maybe a comma you have. But full stop there for a minute. Take a breath. Let's keep that comma. And then he says, and I am come for thy words. You know what he's saying? Daniel, see from the first time you prayed, and I am come to now. It's been three weeks. Three weeks of your heart set, give away, totally abandoned yourself, totally abandoned yourself. And from you did that, Daniel, you were heard, and I am come. It's been three weeks. Where on earth were you, he says? Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and 20 days. Notice one and 20 is what? 21 days. 21 days is how long? Three weeks. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am, I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for the vision is yet. The vision is for yet. Yet the vision is for many days. He says. So, brothers and sisters, I'm not going to do a third. I've enough to do a third morning. I don't want to. I want. I think I'm going to. I'm going to do something else in God's will next Sunday morning. But notice there was a spiritual battle, spiritual war for, for three weeks. Now, I want you to catch this. I want, you to, I want you to catch this. If you haven't heard it all and you can't remember it all, then listen to it again. But I want you to catch it this morning. Because when you're at your weakest, when you're at your lowest, when you're at your worst, when you're saying and you're in that place of mourning and you're, you just have to abandon everything to God. You have abandoned yourself and everything is placed into his hands. I mean everything. It can't be removed like God doesn't remove the sun, moon, and stars. And you've given it to him and you're in mourning that his name might be known. Maybe for a lost loved one that, that, uh, that are out there in their sin and, and you're praying, saying, well, I'm leaving that with you and I'm abandoning my heart to you, Lord. You know what it is. A grandchild, a, a son, a daughter, a wife, a husband, whoever it may be. A situation, a circumstance, the, 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 the things that are happening in our land, and we'll talk about that tonight, God willing. And when you give that up to the Lord, not to take it back. When you're on your knees and you think God's not hearing, when you're on your face and you feel God is nowhere near you. Here's what you need to hear this morning. Daniel didn't know that his prayers, his heart given, started to turn the tide. Started to turn the tide. God answered and sent forth the angel. Spiritual battle happened and Daniel knew nothing about it. I wonder what spiritual battle's happening over your prayers this morning. I wonder what spiritual battle's ha battle is happening over your life and your family, over our land this morning. I wonder, is there enough men and women praying for Ulster because of the state it's in, in the land grab of the European Union through the Irish Republic? That's a demonic spirit, isn't it? I'm convinced of it. It's a beast system. I wonder how many of us pray about these things. Or are we so parochial it's just us four no more? I mean, that's all, that's as far as we get. Brother, sister, this morning, understand when you abandon your heart and give it to God, something happens. A man and a woman like that seeking the face of God. Spiritual warfare takes place. God moves in your behalf because he hears and he answers prayer.
The demon prince didn't want the temple rebuilt. Didn't want the sacrifice to start. Didn't want the blood of the lamb to be shed. Didn't want worship to continue. Didn't want the Lord to be praised. Didn't want the word of prophecy to be fulfilled. Didn't want Daniel to stop praying. Or wanted Daniel, pardon me, to stop praying. But notice, that's what the devil wanted. But the devil's a defeated foe. You're on the victory side. Uh, one thought, I promise you I'll stop. Just one thought. In Ephesians 6 and verse 12, it's, Paul writes, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I note this. Notice what Paul says. He says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's spiritual. I watched a video from some of the people in the street preaching last night. All these young girls mainly. All dressed just with their, that sort of dress you see many young girls dressing in that would be provocative to, and because the camera was there, two young girls started kissing one another. And they're misled. But we could get angry at that. No, brothers and sisters. Don't hate someone because of their thoughts like that. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them because there's a spirit holding them. And they need set free. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. See that word rulers of the dark rulers? It's a word, and it's a big long word, by the way. Cosmacrator, or cosmacrator, okay? It's made up of two words. One is cosmos, the world or the system of our, not the earth, the planet, the system of our world, the system of it. And everything that we spoke about there and all the young people, how they're being deluded now and the whole thing thing we see in the, in, on news all the time about the agendas that they're bringing out. And do you know now they're talking about children as four, as young as four now, I was in the Telegraph, are being allowed, are going to be allowed to determine their own gender without their parents' consent. Without their parents' consent. Now, if that's not a demon spirit, I don't know what is. We think of the, the alcoholism and the drug addiction and the violence and the whole world system, the banking and, and the usury and all of that stuff. That's the cosmos here. And so the word for rulers of the darkness of this world, it's when we put it together, it's krat, eo, and cosmos, Okay, kratneo means to have power. Kratneo means to have power and cosmos. Hence, we get the rulers of the darkness of this world. And, and it's the only place in Ephesians 6 and 12 where this big word, cosmat krato, or cosmocrato, it's the only place in Scripture for this rulers of darkness. Rulers, underline the rulers. That's the word for it. It's the only place in the New Testament that that word is used. But if you go to Revelation chapter 1, as we spoke of earlier, this man who appeared to Daniel is now this man in Revelation chapter 1. I haven't time to go into it, but if you go into Revelation 4 and 8, Revelation 11 and 7, Revelation 15 and 3, Revelation 16 and 7, Revelation 19 and 5, and Revelation 21 and 22. And if you read those verses, I'm going to read the first one and we're finished. 
Revelation 1 and verse 8. Here is the one who's coming in the clouds in Revelation 1 and 7, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, I am the Lord Jesus, Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Not one mighty one among many other mighty ones or a few mighty ones. He says, I am the Almighty. Now the rulers of the darkness, the rulers of the darkness of this word, the cosmacrator, the cosmacrator, hear the word Almighty, underline it. It's the same one who appeared to Daniel in Daniel 10. Underline it. The word there is pantocrator, or pantocrator. It's the exact same only panto takes over, and it means the one with all the power. And every verse I give you there, you'll have to listen again to get them. Every one that says, Jesus says, the Almighty, they worship the Almighty, the Almighty, the Almighty, Pantocrator, 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 the Pantocrator. He is above all others. He's above all else. None can stand before him, and the devil is a defeated foe. Brothers and sisters, leave here today. Give your heart to Christ afresh. One, this whole period of the last 18 months has caused the church to be sleepy. Who was I talking to earlier? I talked about that to them. Anyway, sleepy. Oh, yes, it was Pastor George McConnell this morning on the phone. That's what it was. He says, Ken, I, 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 do you think, is it just me or is it this time? He says, the church has fallen asleep. He says, they've become, they've become lazy and they're, they're their passion for Christ is dimmed in many places. I says, 100%, George. I says, but God has his own. He's sifting the church and he's going to bring forth the corn out from the tares, the wheat from the tares. And brothers and sisters, give him your heart. We're going to sing and worship him. Let's give on to the Lord and ask the team to come up. Yes.